so part four continued um, at this point the mariner has lost his crew and uh, he's alone on the ship by himself and at this point he is sitting and uh, beyond the shadow of the ship he says I watched the water snakes they moved in tracks of shining white and when they reared the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes so he's watching these water snakes in the water uh, they're some of the creatures that live in the ocean and he says that oh happy living things no tongue their beauty might declare a spring of love gushed from my heart and I bless them unaware uh, so he blesses them in this moment these sort of uh, water snakes that he would have otherwise thought were ugly and creepy um, and at this moment when he blesses them the albatross falls from his neck and sank in, like lead into the sea so the albatross that was hung around his neck as punishment has dropped down so he no longer has to wear this bird about his neck the cross that he's uh, born for this long has dropped from his neck and then part five he goes into a deep sleep and he has dreams of being his quen his thirst being quenched and when he wakes up it's raining so it seems as if his luck has sort of changed a little bit. He uh, has the start of good things occurring uh, at this point. So he's being helped by nature. Uh, the clouds have come and he's now, his thirst is being quenched. And then the winds are starting to pick up. So it seems as if the natural world is again taking some pity on him. And... Uh, it seems to be related to the fact that he has blessed these water snakes. So, um, somebody who at first killed the albatross, then he blesses the presence of the water snakes, and then he's rewarded for that. So, it's a connection to the natural world and his appreciation of it. And then he talks about the loud wind never reached the ship, yet the ship moved on. So, there are these sort of supernatural forces taking place around him. Um, and it culminates with all his dead men coming back to life in a way um, and it seems as if the spirits spirits inhabit it inhabit his uh, crew and help the ship move forward so the dead men they're still dead it's just they sort of come to life as a almost like a skeleton crew so his men are sort of, um, they're, they're still dead, but they are uh, raised from the dead from these spirits that inhabit their, their bodies. And uh, he describes, they raised their limbs like lifeless tools. We were a ghastly crew. And then he explains to the wedding guest who says, I fear the ancient mariner. And he says, "'Twas not those souls that fled in pain, which to their corpses came again, but a troop of spirits blessed. For when it dawned, they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast. Sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed. So they're inhabited by spirits who help the ship move forward. And then when they're done their work, they fall down dead again, and the souls pass from their bodies. So you can see some of the influence of this text on other texts as well. I think of Pirates of the Caribbean and the Skeleton Crew. Um, obviously, it's a sort of reference to this text as well. Um, in this image of the, the Skeleton Crew coming to life. Part 5 continues, and you have uh, the Mariner... Um, listening to the skylark singing so it seems as if he's appreciating the little creatures of nature at this point um, at first he took for granted the presence of the albatross now he seems to appreciate all the animals and creatures around him so he's sort of learning his lesson slowly as he he maintains or as he sort of suffers through all this um, unfortunate uh, tr uh, survival and then uh, in this sort of half-life sleep that he goes through, he hears two spirits in the air. Uh, so there's two sort of spirits that he hears talking, and they have this exchange, and they're talking about him. 
Um, this is at the bottom, near the end of part five. And it says, Is it he, quoth one, is this the man by him who died on cross? With his cruel bow he laid full low the harmless albatross. So they're talking about him as the man who uh, killed the harmless, the innocent albatross. And uh, the spirits are sort of discussing uh, what he's endured and what he has left to do. And then they, part five ends with saying, the man hath penance done and penance more to do. So it's clear that the mariner is paying, is paying for his sins of killing the albatross, and this is part of his punishment. And he has to make it up to uh, the spirit world uh, for this transgression against nature that he did, this harmful, violent act that he did, and now he's paying for it. So part six continues um, as the mariner... Uh, looks at his crew and uh, again he uh, is has sort of supernatural luck on his side at this point because he has blessed uh, all the creatures that he's seen from this point on and uh, he starts he actually sees land at this point so he can see a lighthouse and the hill and recognizes this as his uh, country and the ship is blowing closer and closer to land. And then he turns his eyes upon the deck and sees each body of his crew uh, surrounded by uh, seraphs. So uh, they're sort of like angels that uh, represent each soul of the man of the men who have died. And they again go off to uh, the other world or whatever, heaven, and that he's sort of forgiven for his sins so they no longer curse him. So he's being forgiven for indirectly causing the death of his crew. And at this point, at the end of part six, he recognizes that there is a ship in the dis or a boat in the distance uh, that is uh, crew there on the crew is a pilot, a pilot's boy, and a hermit. So he he is going to be saved. And and then he thinks he singeth loud. At this is the very end of part five. He's or part six. He says that he makes in the wood. He'll shrieve my soul. He'll wash away the albatross's blood. So he's talking about the hermit, and then being sort of given forgiveness for. Uh, killing the albatross at last. He'll be given some sort of uh, forgiveness at this point on. So part seven, uh, the, the ancient mariner is rescued as the boat with the hermit and the pilot and the pilot's boy uh, gets nearer and nearer. And his ships, the mariner's ship sinks uh, so the boat came closer to the ship, but I nor spake no, nor stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. Uh, it reached the ship, it split the bay, the ship went down like lead. So the mariner's ship sinks, and he's left in the water. My body lay afloat, but almost immediately he is rescued by the three men in their small boat. And because of the way the mariner looks, he looks like, you know, half crazy and that he's been sort of on his last legs. They don't know whether he's alive or dead. Uh, they ask him, the hermit asks him, I bid thee say, what manner of man art thou? And then this uh, is where we get uh, the extent of the mariner's sort of penance that he has to pay from now on. Uh, he is forced to tell his tale, and then he explains uh, how he's compelled to tell this story to passers-by. And he says, Since then, at, a, at an uncertain hour, that agony returns, until my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. I pass like night from land to land, I have a strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know that man that must hear me to him my tale I teach. 
So the marinara will go uh, walking from land to land, and when he comes across somebody who has to hear his tale, he stops them and tells the tale because they need to hear it in order to learn the moral or lesson of the tale of his story. So at this point we get, uh, we're back into the framing narrative with the wedding guest and he's the one who has to hear this tale, so he's the one who has to learn the lesson. So our final um, segment is the mariner uh, returning to the his discussion with the wedding guest and explaining to him the moral of the story. So this is at the very end of the poem where he says, Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest. He prayeth well who loveth well, both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best who loveth best, all things both great and small. For the dear God who loveth us, who loveth us, he made and loveth all. And this is the moral or purpose of the Mariner's Tale. And it ends up making the young man who has listened to it a uh, wiser, sadder, um, but more, I think he has this sort of lesson now that he's learned uh, that he needed to hear from the old mariner. And then the mariner uh, leaves, uh, but he's, again, still, he has a lifetime of sharing this tale. That's what his for, sort of final curse is, or his penance to tell his tale to anybody he passes who needs to hear or learn this lesson. So if we look at the the moral... Um, it has to do with man's or humanity's uh, respect of all natural creation. Um, so he prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast. So it is a sort of lesson to love and respect all things, both great and small, humans and animals, and to respect all of God's creations and to love with them all. So we have that kind of moral at the end. It's kind of a respect for the natural world. And this again uh, nicely ties in with the Romantics, uh, Coleridge's uh, view of the natural world as um, having a sort of spiritual or divine element in it and to respect nature as a reflection of all of God's creation. So that's where our narrative uh, poem ends. So something that we can think about in for analyzing this uh, narrative is, you know, why does the mariner shoot the albatross in the first place? And we can sort of see that as a, an act of arrogance. Um, he saw something in nature and he shoots it and kills it. And in this way, it sort of proves his superiority or gains him a sense of power over nature. And then the events that sort of play out after he does this act sort of suge suggest that um, it's sort of nature taking revenge for this act of cruelty and his arrogance. Um, and I think we can see this in... Um, in the fact that he is sort of trying to take or taking nature for granted or the natural world for granted and uh, has to sort of, uh, he's punished uh, by nature through uh, extreme deprivation, thirst, the weather, and all these forces of nature that sort of uh, are part of his punishment. So he eventually learns the lesson he learns the lesson or the moral of the story that he should respect all of God's creations and the natural world. Um, so bird, beast, all living things uh, are part of nature and should be respected and loved. And this is part of his the lesson that he has to learn. Some critical readings have also viewed this as a religious allegory. And there is a lot of sort of Christian imagery, uh, biblical imagery in the story where the mariner is kind of an archetypal sinner and he uh, goes against God's creation by killing the albatross and then he pays for his sins. Um, so he has to wear the albatross like a cross or a burden and then he must seek uh, redemption through penance and he becomes a kind of prophet or storyteller spreading his message 
uh, to anybody who will listen and who needs to hear his story.